I'm here to tell you that counting the dead is one of the most important things that we can do to help the living. And that it's particularly important in this 21st century to address adult health, which is the leading health challenge. Now, like David Naylor, I'm an epidemiologist, so I'm going to give you lots of numbers. And I apologize. You know, the criticism of epidemiologists is that we're number crunchers like accountants. That's not fair. Accountants have more personality. <laughs> so let's start about 300 years ago when the astronomer Haley, Edmund Haley, uh, I guess being a bit bored between finding comets, dabbled in epidemiology and noted the first light table for England, which is basically the survival shown on the vertical axis and the age, which is on the horizontal axis. And at that time, about 40% of those born would be dead before age 10. And very few would make it past middle age. Now, my definition of middle age changes as I grow older, but for today I'm going to say roughly 30 to 70 years. <laughs> Things didn't get much better to 1860. And in fact, this was the same in the United States and in Canada. And if you go back to the Roman times, it was the same. Most life was as Thomas Hobbes said, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. But by 1910, England had had child mortality. Still, very few people made it into old age, but child mortality was substantially down. But by 1960, child mortality had become rare in England. And today, in 2010 or so, most people in England can expect to reach age 70. And that recent transformation has really been because adult mortality has gone down as a result of reduced smoking or low-cost treatments like aspirin. Now, the transformation of mortality has been more complete in high-income countries, but it's gone faster in developing countries. So in 1960, Ethiopia looked a lot like England did in 1860, and China and India looked like England in the 1910s. Now today, they've substantially lowered their death rates. Still, most people in developing countries do not live as long, or certainly do not live, reach the age as they do in England. But the transformation of child mortality has been extraordinary. In 1950, a quarter of all children born in the world would be dead before age five. Today, that's 6%. That's still about 7 million deaths. But if today the world had child mortality rates like Canada had just 100 years ago, we'd have 30 million deaths, not 7 million. And conversely, if the world had child mortality rates like Canada has today, we'd have only 1 million child deaths. Now, let me ask, how many of you have seen that movie, X-Men, about mutants living among us? Okay, are there any mutants here? No. Well, I want to submit that, in fact, we are all public health mutants. 200 years ago, most of us would have been dead because of these patterns. And I'm going to make this audacious claim by comparing English men to worms. <laughs> now, C. elegans, which is shown on the top, is the most studied species ever in biologic science. If you take C. elegans and sequentially knock out some genes, then you can get it to live much past the usual expectancy of about 20 days. Interestingly, this experiment took about 180 days, about six months. So it's about nine generations in worm terms. And the C. elegans mutation is surprisingly delicate. You change the pH or change the temperature and bye-bye worm. In contrast, English male survival reached comparable increases in about three to four generations. And English men are not as delicate as worms. So therefore, the mortality changes has been much more durable. So let's continue with the other bits of good news. The most important of which is that it's getting cheaper and cheaper to save the life of a child. This shows trends over 40 years. About 
how much it costs to save the next life of a child. So developing countries are able to buy health at lower cost than they were in the past. And it's much like the phenomenon you see in other technology, like cell phones or computing or even air travel. It's getting cheaper and cheaper. In addition, the world has made spectacular inroads in controlling some big diseases. Smallpox used to kill about 3 million children a year, including one of my grandmother's 12 children, my aunt who died at age 3 in the 1930s. Smallpox has been eradicated. Today, more than 80% of the world's children get life-saving immunizations that used to cause about 5 million deaths just a few decades ago. The bad news is for adults. Adult survival is becoming more and more costly. Now, if you take women, you'll see the same rising curve as for men. If you take out the effects of two big epidemics, HIV infection and tobacco, that curve flattens but doesn't go down. Now why? Well, the same process that has improved child mortality, which is technology, this diffusion, research, public attention, has not yet gone into adult health, particularly in developing countries. So the big challenge of the 20th century, 21st century is to reduce premature adult mortality. So where do we start? Well, worldwide there's about 60 million deaths a year, of which 50 million occur in developing countries. And most of those are after age five. India, for example, is about nine million deaths a year. And India is typical in that most deaths occur at home, not in the hospital, and not in front of a doctor. So you really don't know how to get at the causes of death. So what is a solution? An interesting solution was imposed 140 years ago by the sanitary commissioner of the government of India, who wrote, quote, for sanitary purposes, it is indispensable to know the relative mortality in small and as far as possible well-defined tracts to ascertain the death rates in these communities, to see how far they arise for preventable causes, and to apply the remedies. That's what we're doing in the Indian Million Death Study today. Working with the Registrar General of India, we survey about a million homes, so you get a true snapshot of India. You send non-medical teams like these two out to the homes with computers, so you can track them using GPS. For all the deaths, they get a simple information, including a half-page narrative. And this then is converted to medical records that two of 500 physicians look at very rigorously. Joseph Stalin once said that the death of one man is a tragedy, but the death of millions is a mere statistic. But I'll submit that what we've got in the Million Death Study are actually a million stories. And I want to share with you one particular story. And this is an actual one, but names changed, of course. Sharmila was 23. She was very weak. Before delivery, she was admitted to the government hospital in Jamsedpur. On experiencing difficulty, they advised her to take her to Lucknow because they could not cope with it. The family did not have money, so they took her home. A professional Dai or midwife came. The baby could not come out because of mother's weakness. The Dai pulled the baby out with her hands together with the placenta. Excessive bleeding took place. Sharmila became unconscious. The child died. And after delivery, about half an hour later, Sharmila died. We learn from each of these stories of how to improve health. In this case, for Sharmila and a thousand other maternal deaths that we study, the key finding is that emergency obstetrical services could knock out obstetric deaths about, by about 70%. We learned some other things as well. For example, that about 4 to 12 million girls have been aborted before birth since 1980, half of which have been just in the last decade. And as I'll show you, smoking and malaria are much bigger causes of death. But there's also good news that there are only 100,000 HIV deaths in India versus 400,000 predicted earlier. And importantly, every disease that's common in one part of India is rare in another suggesting avoidable factors, including those that await further scientific discovery. So let's start with malaria. Well, malaria by our estimates killed about 200,000 Indians before age 70, and it killed not just children, but also adults in this U-shaped pattern. By contrast, the World Health Organization said there were only 15,000 deaths from malaria. Well, why? WHO relied on properly diagnosed malaria patients, 
But because malaria is not just treatable, it's curable, you can actually not estimate mortality among those that you treat. Now, we rely on family histories of these deaths, so there obviously will be some misclassification. But where we observe malaria deaths is precisely where malaria, the most dangerous type, was reported to occur by the government program. So I grew up in Manitoba, where the provincial word is the mosquito. So what does this matter? Well, this pill is an artisanate combination therapy. It's a miracle drug. It's been given to children in Africa, and it's knocked down child mortality greatly. The same strategy could be applied for adults to save lives. And in fact, if you look in Africa, you see the same U-shaped pattern, that malaria doesn't just kill children, but it kills adults. So let's turn to smoking. Prior to World War II, lung cancer was quite a rare disease. But thanks in part to these good cause of death statistics, uh, people observed a massive increase in lung cancer. And no one really knew why. So the UK Medical Research Council sent a younger Richard Dahl, shown here on the right, as standing, to go and investigate. And Dahl went and studied lung cancer and concluded that smoking was a major cause of lung cancer. And importantly, he went on to study 30,000 British doctors with Richard Pito, who's also shown here, over 50 years. And they documented that British doctors who smoked for long term lost about a decade of life. But they only did so in 2004. And when they started, about 80% of the doctors smoked. It was actually higher than the population smoking. Now, Dahl was very clever, and he published these results in the British Medical Journal, the interim results. And when doctors read this, they said, my goodness, this doesn't just kill patients, it kills us. <laughs> so many of them quit. And then he was able to study that those that quit had substantially reduced risks of death. Now, women started smoking much later than men, about two decades later. And it's only in October of last year, believe it or not, that we actually got 21st century estimates of the risk of smoking in women. And one of our, these studies was our study done in the United States in a novel system called the National Death Index, which is a bit like Facebook for dead people. And the idea is very simple. You survey 200,000 living people, link them to this National Death Index, and if they're dead, you get their information. And what did we find? Well, very simple. Women who smoke like men die like men. There's about a threefold higher risk of death among either men or women that smoke. And in terms of the probability of reaching age 80, it's remarkably much lower for women who smoke than women who don't. Now, smoking kills, but quitting is ridiculously effective, such that among men or women that had quit by age 40, they got back nine years of the decade of life they would have otherwise lost. And even quitting by age 60 meant you got four years of life back. So let's go back to India. Well, from the million death study, we've determined that there's already about a million smoking deaths a year in India, most of which occur in middle age. Now, men who smoke beanies, which is the local manufactured cigarette, lose six years of life. The few women who smoke in India smoke beanies, and they lose eight years. And the men who smoke the Western cigarette lose 10 years. And the cigarette is displacing the BD, so this, these risks are going to grow. So why is this important? Well, you know, there's that expression that death and taxes are unavoidable in life, but they don't need to be in that sequence because the most important intervention to reduce smoking is actually to raise tobacco taxes. And we've taken this information and worked with the Minister of Health to convince the current finance minister to raise taxes on cigarettes. And taxes went up in February by about 18 percent, less than what we had asked, but still something. And that might save about 600,000 lives just from that simple tax increase. So I want to come back to my opening about the importance of good mortality statistics. Those statistics are the heart of global health progress. They're more important today than they were 100 years ago. 
And what the world needs is a massive investment to try to increase the quality and coverage of these statistics. And we proposed what is called the 10 million death study, which would try to obtain pretty rapidly good quality mortality data from 60 developing countries to make it completely open source so that it can be used imaginatively and with no restrictions. And we hope that this would help correct some of the problems that we have with current statistics, one of which is done by a group in Seattle, which is called the Global Burden of Disease. Now, the Global Burden of Disease, unfortunately, has to rely on what you see on the left side of very few countries having good data, like we've now got in India. So in fact, for 110 countries, and 25 million deaths, they have only 29,000 deaths with actual information. And that kind of ratio is something we haven't seen since the claims of weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. We can transform this, and we know how. And we know how to do this at low cost. So in sum, let me conclude by emphasizing the big message of epidemiology, the 200-year message of epidemiology, is that death before old age is avoidable. Death early in life should be rare. Death in middle age need not be common. And I hope I've convinced you that the best investment that we can do to help the living is to count the dead. Thank you.